This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to another episode of Dokomomo Hawaii's uh, show about local architecture and mid-century modern architecture here in Hawaii. Uh, I'm today's host, Graham Hart, and uh, we're doing this series in kind of preparation for our uh, September Dokomomo National Symposium going to be held here in Hawaii. Uh, today's show is about uh, architect Edwin Bauer, and this is going to be our third installment. Um, John Williams and I have kind of tag teamed uh, doing a couple of shows here and there about Edwin Bauer, and we've got another special guest, Denby Fawcett, with us as well today. Right. So actually, if, um, yeah, thank you both for being here today. But if we can go to the first slide, I kind of want to introduce uh, the importance of Bauer and why we've been doing these so many shows about him. Um, so Bauer has done just so many different projects uh, during that time period throughout um, Hawaii, really in general, and specifically in Waikiki, and has really defined the skyline. And we didn't really know a lot about him. Um, we've slowly pieced together a lot of his projects, but um, now we're starting to learn more about his personal life and who he was. But this is a great photo that actually Denby was able to find and uh, just from left to right here are all these, these uh, gentlemen here on the screen. We got Alfred Price, uh, Pete Wimberly there in the, in the Aloha print, uh, Guy Rothwell, Edwin Bauer sitting there uh, dead in the middle, and then um, Vladimir Osipov standing above him, and Wilson Fisk. So really up there with the greats of that period. Um, so actually we want to start off with maybe the next slide. and. Um, having John talk about how his introduction to Bauer. Yes, uh, the Dokomomo group does a walking tour every October, a really great walking tour. And four years ago, I picked out this building just because it, it looked really interesting and I wanted to learn more about it and started doing the research for being the docent for this building on the walking tour. And I just the more I looked at the building and studied it, I thought that the composition of the architecture, the, the way the forms were arranged, the, uh, just the um, detailing was really great. Now, this is a photograph of the building when it was uh, pretty new. It's still there. It's still very much intact, except the ground floor looks nothing like that. But if somebody ever came along and wanted to restore, it would be a great project. But after learning so much about the building, I knew that the name of the architect was Edwin Bauer, but I didn't really know much more than some of the other prominent buildings that he completed in the 1950s and um, into the 1960s. So I, for me, it was um, just, who was this guy? Well, if you go to the next image, I wasn't the only one. So I actually live at this building. This is the Kalia, and I've uh, lived here for 10 years. We've, we've my mom actually bought into it about 14 years ago, and uh, we have been living there for, for quite a while. And you know, I'd always appreciated the building, but I wasn't the one that you know sought after it. But after seeing this postcard, um, kind of actually roaming around on the internet, I uh, realized like, wow, this this building was you know really well designed and was kind of very you know celebrated back in the day, and um, it was really something to kind of uh, you know look at and kind of I wanted to know more, and so then. I had learned a little bit about Bauer as well, and then we, John and I started kind of exchanging some notes about who was this guy and all the projects he mm -hmm. had done. And um, on the next slide, um, John well, this, has, yeah, kind yeah, of this is another. Uh, from our walking tour this last October. The Hale Hana is a Bauer building, and it's uh, just off the edge of Waikiki, across from the Waikiki Fire Station and Waikiki Library. And as I was presenting. The building to several groups of people that were coming along. Along comes Denby. I came on the tour, I'm a columnist for Honolulu Civil Beat, and I was actually thinking, oh, maybe I can get a story out of this tour. So when we stopped at Halehana, uh, John was telling us about the architect that did it, and his name was Edwin Bauer, and he had also done a hotel in Waikiki called The Breakers, and that brought back to memory to me why I knew Bauer. I had gone to the Breakers about 10 years ago when I was working as a TV reporter for KITV. The cameraman and I had gone down there to cover the theft of some fabric art. Thieves had broken into a hotel room there and stolen this very valuable fabric art. 
But the cameraman and I were more intrigued with the building than we were with the story we were supposed to be there covering, because to see this beautiful low-rise hotel in the midst of Waikiki, which already, of course, was getting very high-rise. So we kept asking questions like, who built this? Why is it here? Why is it still here? Why hasn't it been torn down? And the features of that hotel are sort of like this Holly Hana in a way. It's low, it's comfortable, you see a lot of sunlight, there's opening, and it had Hawaiian um, features to it, lava and lots of landscaping. So when I went on John's tour, then it brought to my mind, oh, I, this architect is incredible, you know, I do want to know more about him. So John told me there are no pictures of him at all. And I thought, no pictures, how can that be? You know, this guy's prominent architect, architect in Hawaii. So I went home and started looking on the internet just to kind of show off, to say, of course, there are pictures of him, and found um, not only a lot of pictures of him, but also all these buildings that he'd created. And I, I grew up in Hawaii in his period in the 1950s. So I thought, oh my gosh, all these things that I'm, I've been surrounded by all my life are uh, many of them by Edwin Bauer. Well, and if we go to the next image, this pushed me to go back and try to find out more about where Bauer came from, what were the influences on Bauer's life. And on the left, you see that ad, this is from a, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle in the 1920s. Uh, Bauer's father, his name was Louis A. Bauer. Louis Bauer was in a partnership uh, with a gentleman by the name of Quinn, and they were developing residential properties on the west side of San Francisco. So, and this ad in 1920 would have been about when Bauer was 15. And so it would, obviously Bauer was growing up with a developer uh, that was interested in not only developing houses, but um, just the world of architecture. And so Bauer went off to college. He attended the University of Southern California, graduated in 1929. And then he worked for several smaller architects. And the reason that there's a picture there of the Golden Gate Bridge is not because Bauer designed it, but he was working with a firm, Morrow and Morrow, for six years in the 1930s. And about the midpoint of that, um, this picture was taken. Irving Morrow was the architect consulting on the Golden Gate Bridge, so this would have been very much part of Bauer's um, experience in the 1920s, having this and working for such a prominent architect. But that still didn't answer, well, how did he get to Hawaii? So if we go to the next image, on the left is a picture of Roy and Estelle Kelly and their three children. Roy is um, phenomenally well known here in Waikiki and Honolulu. He developed the uh, Outrigger Hotels. All of that was after World War II, but in 1941, Roy Kelly had a successful firm of his own that was developing and building small apartment buildings. And in 1941, before World War II started, Bauer came to Hawaii with his wife and his uh, first of his four children and worked for Roy Kelly. And it's, that was pretty um, obvious choice for Bauer because it turns out that Roy Kelly and Bauer were classmates at University of Southern California. And also we found out that um, Bauer's father had been coming to Hawaii on a regular basis starting back in the 1800s when um, his father was only 20. So we still don't know all of that. But I, the image on the bottom is of a small apartment building. Bauer was released from the War Production Board in 1945, and barely five months later, he was already designing this apartment building and that article in 1946. Um, he's, he's already establishing a name for himself. And if we go to the next image, this, this comes back to Denby. Uh, she can identify what we're looking at. Yeah, this is the Breakers Hotel. And uh, Bauer on the left is speaking with Fred Mahoney, the fellow in the suit, who's the owner of the Breakers Hotel. And you can get some sense of looking at it, how, how nice that hotel was and is to this day. It's still very popular, and people come back year after year to stay there. 
And um, one thing that's a feature there that's not architectural, they have cats there. When you stay there, you can borrow a cat to <laughs> sit with you by the swimming pool. So uh, it's very nice. The cats are kind of tame and love the hotel guests. Go to the next image. Now we're getting in to the 1950s, and um, these are pictures that um, we, NB helped us with. Yes, I found those pictures by getting in touch. It turned out I was Facebook friends with Edwin Bauer's daughter, Paula Bauer. So I messaged her on Facebook and then called her, asked, was your dad an architect? She wrote back and said, oh, yes, my father was Edwin Bauer. So we started talking by phone, and she sent me these wonderful photos, family photos. And uh, she said her father was, did so much work in Hawaii, he'd do two or three major projects a year and actually turn down work. He, he had so much. He was so popular. And I think if we go to the next image, one of the things that um, Graham and I, in our discussions and our discovery about Bauer, he really just knew about Bauer um, himself. It was always Edwin Bauer. But he actually had some very creative people in, um, under his employ. And uh, 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 Graham, talk about some of what you're seeing on these images. Yeah, so in the background there, there's that postcard again of the Kalia. And uh, you know, going through the old plans and documents of, of the building, I, you can look at the bottom corner at the title block and see these um, you know, writings about Edwin L. Bauer, architect, and Frederick Liang, associate architect. And then later on, it was Bauer and Mori. So you kind of had different people that he associated with. Um, later on, it was going to be Bauer Mori Lum was the firm name. So he had uh, Arthur Mori Benjamin. and Benjamin Lum. And then yes. he also uh, had Clarence Miyamoto. Or, yeah. Clarence Miyamoto. Yeah, Clarence Miyamoto working with him as well as, as Frederick Liang. And so kind of each one of them took a different position in designing and drafting and, and really, you know, um, being the architect for a lot of these different projects because he had so many at the time. We were talking about this earlier um, that... Uh, Bauer's, you know, work was he had built so many of these large towers and apartment buildings all within a, you know, a decade that he must have had a, a, a fantastic team to kind of get that through. And we included that um, image on the right there of the uh, memorial, and it's just the range of projects that Bauer's um, and his team were doing, just amazing, and they just a, a consistency and a quality to the work that I think um, even if the people that worked with Bauer were really strong designers. There had to be an influence coming from Bauer to achieve that consistency and, and the quality that he was getting in all these projects. And you're talking about to other architects about the architectural detail, but right. we should care about him, people who are not architects, because we may not know it, but we're surrounded by him. I mean, he's every place we turn, a church, a building here, part of a school. Like, he even designed public housing into which yes. he put furniture, built-in furniture, because his daughter Paula told me he knew the people in the public housing didn't have much money and wouldn't be able to go out and buy dressers for their apartment. So he, he built it in so they wouldn't have to worry about that mm -hmm. cost. We also, on this uh, program, want to get to one of Bauer's uh, big clients and um, big projects. And if we go to the next image, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. leading to no, Graham. Yeah, go for um, it. yeah, so this is actually um, one of Bauer's like, kind of longtime uh, clients, and he did a lot of projects for him. And this was Kaiser's um, Hawaiian Village, which is now yes. the Hilton Hawaiian Village, and looks nothing like this at all. But um, <laughs> this is kind of one of the first uh, buildings that uh, Bauer did with Kaiser and really helped kind of define that, that style of these two-story walk-ups. But he did other projects with Kaiser, and um, one of them is, is on the next slide here. So this is the, uh, the Kaiser compound or the Kaiser estate that we've been calling mm -hmm. it. It's actually a, a series of buildings. It's got a whole um, campus, really, of, of different programs on, on these different buildings. So actually, John and Denby, I think you guys know more about these than I do. Well, I'll give part of the background is that uh, when Kaiser set out to uh, develop this home and compound, he brought in the designer George Wright. 
And um, that was a very, that was a big deal to bring in somebody like that to be the designer. But then uh, through Kaiser's relationship with Edwin Bauer, uh, Edwin Bauer became the architect of record, the local architect doing the construction drawings. And it also allowed uh, Bauer to bring in uh, these influential and talented designers. But I, I think Denby can describe the, what we see on that compound. And yeah, well, this is on, as most people in Hawaii know, right out on Portlock Road. And so you'll, you'll see a number of houses. There's a, a big house, a guest house, circular kennels, and then over to the right is a boathouse. And uh, Henry J. Kaiser, I once had the opportunity to speak with him for about four hours. And he told me that his genius was not knowing anything ex except how to pick the right people. <laughs> and he considered, I think, Edwin Bauer a right person because he kept him on through many projects. And Henry J. Kaiser, his other quality was he was also very loyal to people he respected and liked, which he clearly did Bauer because he gave him so much work. I believe the house was uh, completed about 1959, 1960, to, to give a, a time frame. And it was very much about the time that um, the whole Hawaii Kai uh, suburban development was being done by Henry Kaiser. So actually, in the, in the next slide here, if we look at that, these are some close-up photos of the main house. And it's very, you know, just very horizontal, very open pavilion, very Miesian in its kind of mid-century um, architecture language. And, uh, you know, pretty awesome for something that, you know, yes. was someone of wealth. We were kind of talking about this, yes. someone of wealth could have been doing anything, and he chose to do this. Well, I think people built different houses in Hawaii in that era. They're not the huge block out the sun concrete blocks that you see today. And this house fit in with the neighborhood. It was low rise. I mean, clearly, he had, Henry J. Kaiser had the biggest lot on the block, but the houses were low, they were suburban, they fit in. And I, I think, um, well, let, let's go to the next image. Uh, this is getting into some of the work um, later on with Bauer. And um, the, on the left, you see the Waikiki Business Plaza. And that, was, that was a pretty big building. That was uh, 1965, that's an, an, an opening announcement for the the building and how all the features of the building, including the revolving restaurant on the top that Bauer was very proud of. And he, at this time, the firm was Bauer, Moy, and Lum. And Moy and Lum really hadn't gotten to Bauer um, until the Kaiser house was um, completed, or under construction, excuse me, when they were working on it together. Then the image of uh, 1111 <laughs> Wilder, um, that's still um, um, Bauer, Maury, and Lum, and that was finished in 1969. But then that, that article that's showing in that clip, this um, is an article that was in 1970, and it's announcing that Ben Lum is le leaving the firm of Bauer, Maury, and Lum. And as it turns out, Ben Lum left and started a firm with Clarence Miyamoto, who actually had also worked for a while for Bauer. And the interesting thing from uh, Denby's article in Civil Beat was that actually Clarence Miyamoto saw that and addressed one of our cohorts, um, Allison Carson, and excuse me, Alyssa Carson, and sent her an email talking about his time with Bauer. And so there was different um, people in his firm were having different reactions. And by now, it's the mid-70s, and the, the firm's changing. Um, I included that photograph that's of a building under construction. That's the interstate building that's on South King Street. Uh, for those that have been in Hawaii for a while, that was where the um, Honolulu Civic Auditorium used to be. But that building, by the time that was being built and completed in 1975, that um, it was Bauer Mori Architects. Now, so that the firm had been changing quite a bit. Yeah, and he had a lot of these you know, great collaborators and, and um, different people that he worked with. And um, 
we kind of were learning about all of these different things about his, his work life, but then um, when Denby came in and kind of had this more the side of the story about his personal life, and she found out some amazing information, which is actually on the next slide, this kind of completed the whole story. Oh, yes, when I was looking for the photos, I mean, that was the first thing that came up to me, and I thought, holy cow, you know, he's, he went missing in 1984, and he's never been found. He got on a bus on Cujillo Avenue, and that was it. He was not seen. And so I sent an email to John right away and said, did you know, you know that, that they've never found Edwin Bauer? I mean, we found him everywhere in his buildings, but he's gone and has never been seen since that day. He got on the bus, and he had, in the, the notice there, it says that he's suffering from dementia and he's wearing to look for a man wearing a, a little tag on his arm with his address in case he gets lost and describe that he's almost blind, he can't see, and um, that it's a very terrible situation for someone like that to be in, to be missing. And um, the notices, especially the small one, it, it includes that the, there was someone that saw him, the last person that saw him, um, Got getting on a bus on Cujillo Avenue, and as it turns out, that was George Wimberly. Um, he, of course, he, he had known Bauer his, most of his career and said hello to him, understood why Bauer didn't recognize uh, Mr. Wimberly, but um, it was just kind of the, the full circle of this incredible um, collection of architects. and um, They knew each other right, right through it all. I was able to speak with the detective, Joe Self, who was leading, um, he was the, the head of the Missing Persons Bureau, and he said that they searched very, very hard for him, and it's terribly hard to find people with Alzheimer's, because often, even if you find them, they're afraid, because they're in a, he, he may have gotten off the bus somewhere and then be very afraid, and so they will hide themselves even farther, and you, you can't find them. Yeah, I mean, when uh, Denby had emailed John and, and I about all of this, and we kind of found out the whole missing story or the end or the mystery of, of uh, Bauer and what happened to him, you know, we just kept thinking that this is such tragic irony. Someone with so much vision as an architect who always, you know, had such foresight, you know, forethought and, and sight and worked with his hands and everything really lost his mind and lost his vision at the end, you know, and it's just, it's a tragedy. But it also kind of a little bit, paints the picture of why we don't really know much about him these days and why we've had such a you know, long kind of struggle to find out more about him is because really he went missing and the story went with him. You know, there was no one to kind of pass on a lot of the, you know, the, the personal information that we've found out since so recently. And then Martin Despain, who does this show often, said when I spoke with him that Bauer is the fourth cog in the wheel of the four great architects of mid-century modern Hawaii. So you would have Valdemar Ossipoff, you have George Pete Wimberly, and Alfred Price, and then Edwin Bauer, but he disappeared off the scene, and that case is still open in HPD. Yeah, that, um, it gets to this incredible story of um, these four amazing architects and designers, and um, what we've have taken on ourselves is to um, spread this story about Mr. Bauer, and we're, we're going to continue doing our research. We, these uh, programs have actually brought people out of um, the hinterlands and wanting to talk and share stories. So we, I think um, Denby and I still have some more interviews that we're going to do, especially with um, a couple of Bauer's children, which um, is really interesting. They, uh, two of them in particular are really willing, apparently, to help us understand more about their father and even more about Edwin Bauer's um, grandfather and why did his grandfather um, make so many trips to Hawaii. Um, so we can really get a more complete picture of who this person was. Let's go to the last slide real quick. And we've got a couple of minutes to kind of wrap things up. But I think that's good that John was pointing out kind of next steps for finding out more about you know Bauer's personal life and everything, um, and then I'll actually be back in a couple of months to do Bauer Volume Four of Think Tech and uh, talking a little bit more about you know, kind of the architecture and some of his other 
apartment buildings that he's done. We're hoping to do kind of more of a, an analysis and s kind of show you guys some examples, some diagrams and things about maybe why we think um, there's some genius to what he's done. You know, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, affordable housing these days and sustainability and, you know, opening things up to the trade winds and all of that in kind of an urban setting. Well, Bauer was doing that back in the 50s, and so that's why personally I and yes. I think many other architects are really, you we know. We have a lot to learn. Yeah, we have a lot to learn, and there's a lot of kind of good things we could take away from him. Um, but I think there's one thing really that I really like about this photograph. They're, they all look like they're pretty pleased in um, just the <laughs> optimism, um, 1950, uh, early 1950s, and just all the things that they were envisioning them. Um, the group of them doing and accomplishing in Hawaii. I think it's a, it's a great um, kind of tableau of, of who these people are and where their place is in Hawaiian history. Yeah, and just to kind of add a little bit of, um, of citation to this, this picture here that we're looking at, it's from 1955, and from what we could tell, it was from a uh, Kaiser competition um, and these were all architects who were the judges for the, um, this competition yeah. that Kaiser put on. So, I mean, just, you know, we always joke that Hawaii is such a small place, everyone knows each other, but this is kind of one of those great photos where yeah. it really ties all these different stories together with, you know, a client being Kaiser and, um, you know, Bauer working on his estate and many of his hotels. And then, you know, Pete Wimberly there, who also did some work at the Kaiser Hotel and um, at the Hawaiian Village. Um, and then, you know, Vladimir Osipov and... Alfred Price, everyone's there. This is such a, a great photo. But um, so I think just kind of wrapping up, uh, I want to thank you both again for being on the show sure. today and uh, talking about Bauer and his legacy. And um, uh, we want you guys to you know join us again. Um, I think every Tuesday we have a show alternating between either someone from Docomomo or um, uh, DeSoto Brown as, a, as host right. and talking about right. this mid-century period in Hawaii. And we look forward to um, seeing you all at our symposium uh, in September. September. Yep. Yeah. And thank you again. Aloha. Yeah.